This is the Drug and Disorder podcast series that address illicit economies and peace processes. I am Astrid Jamar, the host of the series and part of the Drugs and Disorder Consortium as a postdoc based in SOAS, the University of London. Through those different episodes, I'm inviting my colleagues to share their expertise based on their rich research experience in borderlands in Afghanistan, Colombia, and Myanmar. Today, I'm inviting my colleagues to, uh, to discuss gender dimension from cross-country perspectives. So let me introduce you the three speakers joining us today. So first, we have Maria Monica Parada Hernandez, who is currently completing her PhD in political science in sunny Albany. Albany. She is part of, and she used to be part of the Drug and Disorder Project as a member of the Observatory on Land Restitution team at the Universidad Nacional de Colombia. So thank you for joining us today, Monica. Thank you for having me, Astrid. Then we have Professor um, Mandy Sadan, who is an Associate Professor and Director of the Graduate Thought Programs at the University of Warwick. Uh, Mandy is also a co-investigator of the Drugs and Disorder, and co she's co-leading the research on Myanmar. Hi Astrid, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for joining. And then finally, we have Orzala Nemat, who is the director of the Afghanistan Research and Evaluation Unit, ARU. Um, Orzala is the co-investigator and co uh, of the project as well, and she's co-leading research in Afghanistan. So welcome, Orzala. Thank you, it's a pleasure uh, to be with you. Thank you. So uh, could you, each of you, introduce the contemporary context in the three countries that you're working on? So, uh, so Colombia continues to be the main cultivator of coca leaf destined to cocaine production. This is uh, something that is combined with high levels of agrarian inequality that make coca one of the main economic sources for thousands of farmers in different Colombian territories. So it was therefore essential to include a specific point on drugs in the peace agreement. Uh, this was signed in 2016. So now we have like almost four, five years of implementation of this peace agreement with a lot of setbacks for the people in the rural areas and especially for the peasants that are involved in uh, coca crop production. Is, but well, in the in 2016, the peace process, there was uh, the government created this national plan for the substitution of illicit crops that would go hand in hand with policies for the distribution of land and other agrarian assets, assets such as credit and agricultural extension services, uh, to offer alternatives uh, to families who derive their livelihoods from the coca production. However, Colombia now is in a critical moment. The peace agreement was signed almost five years ago, and today we see that the agreement is practically dead. Uh, the failure to comply with the agreements, with the specificities of the agreements, has affected and the demobilized ex-combatants and also this, all the victims of the war. So, for example, not even a small part of the commitments regarding the distribution of rural land to peasants have been fulfilled, nor in the consolidation of productive schemes that allow them to improve their quality of life. Uh, on the issue of drugs, the current government has failed to comply with the basic principles of the agreement by insisting on aerial fumigation as the magic formula to end illicit crops and by withdrawing support with the crop, um, for the crop substitution program through which more than 100,000 families living in coca production zones were linked to this uh, program. So the current scenario is quite pessimistic and we are still waiting for like elections next year. So maybe the one, the government that comes in can uh, make something or save a small portion of the peace agreement, which actually is now like drowning. Thank you so much for such a rich uh, update in such a content time. Uh, Mandy, could you also give us a bit of an update on the situation in Myanmar today? Yeah, sure, Astrid. I mean, the, the main problem obviously relates to the coup that took place in February, which has really thrown the country into chaos. And um, it's very difficult to see what the way forward is at the moment in relation to how that's going to resolve itself. Um, but also at the present moment, there's, there's a really big problem with the um, COVID-19 um, epidemic, which has really affected many of the areas where we've been working in, in the project in particular, but throughout the whole country. So, you know, you know, th this year has been incredibly difficult and um, it, one of the things that's been 
most um, significant, though, has been the emergence of the civil disobedience movement. And where that has an impact on um, people who use drugs and um, families affected by these issues as well in the areas where we work in the north and in the Shan state, is that you see um, many public servants, many health workers, many teachers who are withdrawing their, their, their from their roles as government servants. Um, so that's meant it's been in incredibly difficult for people to access health care um, and that is of course a, a problem for people with suffering from COVID-19 symptoms but also for the people who use drugs who need support who find that opportunities for accessing support is very limited anyway but it's become incredibly pressured and for um, for, for people with managing the situation they're in it's, it's been really difficult and it's been exacerbated but there's an incredible solidarity and support for that civil disobedience movement as well so um, you know it's a, it's a really difficult and challenging situation that people are operating in. Now, of course, in the areas where we work, in the Kachin state and the Shan state, um, even before the coup, the peace process was really failing in many ways, and it was, it was deeply problematic. So there are different geographies and different political landscape and diff diff different constraints and opportun opportunities for people. Um, but at the moment, it, it's definitely that intense pressure around the coup which is really affecting everything. Thank you, Mandy. So, Orzala, could you now give us an update on the very intense uh, past few months and weeks in Afghanistan, please? Thank you very much, uh, Astrid. Um, as we all know, Afghanistan in the last uh, one month uh, and a half uh, has gone through tremendous uh, changes, uh, changes of regime, changes of the um, uh, political environment, uh, economic environment, and uh, um, sources of distress and desperation and frustration among the people who still reside in Afghanistan has increased uh, dramatically. Um, in terms of uh, where we are now politically, um, uh, Afghanistan is fully controlled uh, by the Taliban. The Taliban have been uh, an active insurgent since uh, the uh, uh, since the uh, direct international intervention in 2001, uh, and so they came and took full uh, over the whole country. Uh, the government of Taliban are not formally recognized by any country so far, but there is a lot of political engagements with them uh, to negotiate certain issues. Uh, Afghanistan's uh, formal economy is on the verge of collapse because of the bank's uh, closure. Uh, I mean, banks uh, are closed in terms of any international uh, uh, sort of uh, systems of transfers and anything. Banks are open within the country, but with huge restrictions of only maximum of 200 US dollars a week per individual account. Most of the corporate accounts also are applied on several uh, sort of restrictions. So this is more on the formal economy. Um, in terms of uh, a drug situation where we are, um, the country still uh, provides over 80% of the wo world supplies of drugs. Um, it covers uh, the issue of poppy cultivation in Afghanistan covers over, uh, based on some estimation, half a million jobs, full-time equivalent. Um, and the world's response to, to countering narcot uh, narcotics uh, has been, um, in most cases, a failure, uh, whether bombing uh, the labs or destroying or spraying the fields or even in some aspects, the alternative livelihoods, none of them really give any actual results. And finally, uh, the issue of uh, uh, drug um, dependence or those who are uh, fully sort of addicted or depending on drugs has dr drastically increased. And, 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 and having said all of this, I want to sort of also come to an end to also m make a point here that, you know, uh, despite all the challenges that the poppy cultivation is making, and is making uh, the Afghans face, it also is covering a significant part of the rural economy and is part of the rural livelihoods of people, which means men and women and families are benefiting from it. So more or less that's where we are with international community completely disengaging with Afghanistan, 
um, and we are here to sort of see what will be the next uh, as we move ahead. Thank you. Um, so uh, let me. This is. Um, thank you, the three of you, for setting the context uh, so truly in such a short amount of time. Uh, and then, you no, know, like trying to lead to cross-country conversation. Could you, each of you, kind of uh, highlight uh, how are the gender dimension considered within the peace, the peace process and the drug policies in each of the country? And what were the very specific demands formulated in relation to these issues by feminist activists in the three countries? Um, so, Monica, shall we keep going with you, uh, introducing the Colombia situation? Of course, as I told you, the peace process in Colombia was signed five years ago, but the negotiations lasted for four previous years. So, in the midst of these negotiations in Havana, uh, the Colombian women belonging to hundreds of thousands of civil uh, society organizations demanded from the negotiation team that was uh, from the government and from the guerrilla of the FARC. Uh, they demanded the, the incorporation or the inclusion of a gender subcommission to ensure that the agreement adopted a gender mainstreaming approach in each and every component of the peace agenda. So I believe that this is the first time that a peace agreement in the world has made this explicit attempt to form a negotiating team conscious of the specific effects that the war had on women's lives and consequently to create an agenda oriented to offer policy solutions to women's specific demands. So the agreement included specific commitments to address the demands of peasants, indigenous and pro-Colombian women and women former combatants from the guerrillas. Three of the commitments stand out. The first one is the participation of women in all policy design resulting from the implementation of the peace agreement. The second one is the policies to guarantee peasant women's access to land, to uh, loans, to formal credit and education in order to develop or to strengthen their productive capacities and to ensure their economic empowerment. And finally, um, regarding illicit crop production, it was agreed that women would be included as priority in the national uh, crop substitution plan and in all the productive alternatives aimed at reducing the hectares of coca cultivated. So like there was like a, a commitment, at least on the paper, a commitment of including women. This was uh, not something that the government just gave women, but actually the activists were there like pushing uh, for this agenda to happen and they managed to include uh, lots of provisions within the agreement, but of course, like the practice and the implementation has been quite different from what was proposed at first. Thank you, Monica. Mandy, um, could you give us some insight from Myanmar as well? Yes, thank you, Astrid. I mean, it's really interesting to hear how things are panning out in relation to gender and drugs in Colombia, because it's very, very different in, in Myanmar, certainly. And you, you have to kind of think, Obviously, at the moment, there is no functioning peace process. So you've got to think back, you know, three, four or five years and, and take a view of how it was looking before um, the recent coup happened. And, and even then, even when it was being led um, uh, by the NLD, it was clear that, you know, there are serious problems within it. And what we can see now is that there was possibly never a genuine attempt anyway um, by the by the Myanmar military to actually see through uh, a real peace process that was going to lead to a reduction in their power. So, you know, the, the realities of that have become very, very apparent. Um, but within the peace process, I mean, drugs and gender were there, but they were never connected. They're treated as two completely different um, domains. Um, and But they both shared a, a kind of element in that they were both treated as rather low-hanging fruit in some respects. So um, gender was considered something that was easy to manage because it basically involved women's empowerment and kind of just buying into that discourse, um, and not even the, the degree of gender mainstreaming, but more of a, a kind of rhetoric without it being very substantively uh, understood within the political system itself, which was still deeply patriarchal. Um, and then drugs were likewise seen as something that was kind of low-hanging fruit in that it was very much a symbolic um, uh, entity that you, you, the, the military and the various groups that, that came into alliance with them could show their 
um, superficial solidarity at least by engaging in drug uh, destruction displays and this kind of thing and so and that became a symbol of the effect of the, of the peace process the positive power of the peace process which has, as, as I say you know now you can see is completely failing in, in its in, inner workings anyway um, but what's interesting now is perhaps you know maybe there is an opportunity if we think idealistically very blue sky around you know what might happen in the future um, if, if we do believe and possibly it's rather naive to think that the military is going to remove itself or be removed in the in the short or medium term but if you think you know with some sense of um, positivity around the future outcomes for Myanmar people that perhaps there will be a kind of a, a different kind of system in place at some point. Um, the experiences that are occurring now within the civil disobedience movement and, and um, against the coup uh, could have an impact in changing the way that peace processes function um, and the way people understand gender and drugs as, as an important integrated social dynamic. So this very much relates to the experiences of similar in Colombia of women who have actually been actively involved in civil protest movements um, related to the social impact of the, the, the very um, readily available presence of illicit and, uh, drugs in, in local communities and, and the kind of framing of the failings of, of um, the, the peace process and the effect of, of on, on their own societies or a failing political system that are seen as being brought together through the impact of drugs in households and women taking the burden of that. Um, and now you get a lot of young protesters moving into areas um, that were traditionally drug producing areas that have been involved in these kinds of civil movements. And there, there, there's some sense that the young people are getting um, access to a kind of discourse and understanding about the problems of minority areas affected by um, these, these issues around drugs and, and um, the, the, the social changes that have taken place in a very negative way. Um, but there's, there's a more understanding of what that really means at a deeper level on the ground and in, in everyday life. So maybe in the future, there, there's um, some hope it could be brought together in a more integrated way. Thank you, Mandy. That's very interesting. Um, Orzala, can you give us a bit of a background of uh, gender dimension in the Afghan uh, context, please, of the peace process and, and drugs policies? Thank you. Um, it's interesting, um, I mean, looking sort of broader uh, into the context of uh, our drugs and disorder project, uh, it's interesting to see that all three countries uh, through different uh, sort of uh, phases has gone through new changes, uh, coup d'etats, or in the case of Colombia, you know, a peace agreement, and in the case of Afghanistan, a complete blow up of the whole uh, sort of um, uh, formal or uh, semi-formal uh, peace negotiations and talks. Uh, what we have seen in Afghanistan was a complete blow up of any sort of formal process. What uh, We found ourselves on August 15, 2021, with a situation of uh, Kabul collapse in the top leadership of the government uh, running away from Afghanistan and practically Taliban found themselves in Kabul, the capital, uh, beyond their own imagination, using their own words. They, they said we couldn't believe ourselves that we will be reaching there. And the Taliban are known globally for being a very um, gender-wise exclusive um, group. Uh, so from the earlier days, we, we know uh, they have ruled the country before between 96 and 2001, and they were exclusive. They have uh, been engaged with the international community, um, uh, mainly with the United States. They have always been very exclusive. If they never showed to have any single women in their representation. Uh, so the same group with full confidence and with full arrogance have come back, have taken over the country um, and basically started to lead the country, started to announce uh, something like a caretaker government that we are being ruled by at the moment as I speak. And most of the caretaker positions are um, 
basically, uh, you know, um, uh, men. Uh, so uh, in terms of formal uh, peace or uh, process, there is no such thing existing at the moment as we speak. In terms of indirect conversations with the Taliban, we know that different channels are still active trying to negotiate Women activists have also not sort of completely surrendered to it. So there are different forms of resistance taking shape. Uh, some women are protesting, most women are protesting completely peacefully. So no women groups are involved in any kind of armed struggle. And they are taking their rights to basically come forward and demands for something very basic. Uh, one thing that I find quite interesting in listening to, to other countries, Myanmar and Colombia, is that Unfortunately, in the broader discussions and discourses around Afghanistan, we have completely yet again uh, forgotten to talk about rural women and, and the rural economy and those who are engaged in these uh, activities, whether blessed or illicit in terms of earning a living. So we don't have those sort of like unions or organizations that would bring forward the voices from uh, rural communities. These are things that uh, in our research, they are slowly and carefully showing up and that they require in the longer term to look into in terms of, you know, how possibilities could be there in terms of addressing the needs of those who are the main uh, who, who have the, the, the drugs uh, as the main sources of their income and how their needs should be sort of access. The fear just to end that, uh, with is that the Taliban will, be, will follow very harsh policies of banning opium. Uh, it, will, it will be interesting because it, opium has been a source of revenue for Taliban, quite a significant one. Uh, and uh, on the one hand, it's a source of revenue. On the other hand, they are um, also banning it as one, one of the very few promises the Taliban made to the world was to ensure that they will ban uh, opium. Uh, so we will see where it will take, but the basic very rapid sort of observation of the situation uh, is indicating a must flourishing of the smuggling and of the opium cultivation uh, already this year. So we will see when the policies of the new regime changes, how that will sort of uh, change or take shape as we move ahead. Thank you, the three of you. So I think like before we go to the next topic, I would like to take a few minutes and to kind of think how those, what those three countries being discussed in parallel bring forward. So I don't know if any of the three of you have a comment to make. Yeah, I think the point that Ozala just made then about um, rural women in Afghanistan being really under everybody's radar, I think that that's also true in, in Myanmar too. And the, the fact that when we're talking about drug eradication policies or alternative development policies, they're, they're very rarely discussed with any kind of gender context at all. Um, when uh, you actually look at the rural economy, it, it, how can you separate out um, the gender dynamics of it? It's impossible. So, you know, ju just the absence of that within the discourses around drugs in, and uh, producing communities in rural areas is really important, I think, as a dimension that needs to be uh, engaged with more fully by policymakers. In terms of, you know, looking at where we are heading, I mean, in the case of um, uh, Afghanistan, it's, 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 it remains to be seen really because uh, with, the, with this level of complete withdrawal of uh, international aid agencies uh, and funding from Afghanistan because of the possible sanctions and limitations, any insights towards uh, maintaining the alternative livelihoods uh, type of program despite their shortcomings, you know, is going is, is gone in vain basically there will no longer be any kind of opportunities to ensure that people who will probably be forced to ban opium because of the Taliban restrictions will survive so there are some extremely alarming uh, figures in terms of you know or or sort of alerts coming from uh, the UN humanitarian uh, uh, departments in terms of very very destitute level of poverty uh, uh, starvation in many parts of the country, and they are all in some ways are linked to the illicit economy. So, I mean, in Afghanistan in general, we are now very fresh for, with the situation and what happens. And in terms of, you know, analysis, it will be very early to say. So we are more kind of in a 
waiting and seeing how the situation will change because the Taliban, if they remain the main ruler as they are at the moment, it seems to be the case probably in the near short future, if not longer term future, it's going to be quite interesting because on the one hand, they will have a country and a rural population with extreme level of poverty. On the other hand, they, based on their own policies, they have a religious obligation to ban opium. And on the third part, this opium can respond to two needs, revenues for the Taliban to rule the country, regardless of the international aid flow, that is uh, one bargaining chip that the internationals are uh, sort of using, and at the same time responding to the brutal poverty. So we will see how that will change. And I think uh, uh, the next uh, six months are quite critical in terms of seeing where Afghanistan will be directed in this. Um, so I'd be interested to know also from other contexts and how that sort of um, is the case with, with uh, Colombia, for example, as well. Thank you. Okay, can I? <laughs> No, I just wanted to say like uh, something that it's quite intriguing in the Colombian case and that it's also intriguing in other cases is who is pushing this agenda on gender, you know, because it's like the, the, the opportunities, that, the, the, structural, the structural, the political opportunities that women may have to actually um, influence this agenda, the political agenda is quite important. So probably in other countries, this, this is not like an open or a, like a window of, of opportunity for activists to push and to press um, to make some pressure on the on the government uh, to adopt certain measures. So in Colombia, it's I me. Mean, I'm not saying that the, the situation for Colombian feminists and activists is the ideal one, but at least I think that uh, in the last 20 or 30 years, probably the feminist movement have been have been like strengthening itself because precisely because of all of these peace processes and the involvement of women uh, in peace solutions, which is something that we necessarily need to check. What are women activists on the ground doing um, like to actually make some impact at the local or at the national level? Thank you so much, Trivia. Thank you, everyone, uh, for all the great insights and kind of introducing the gender dimension and how it has evolved through the different uh, efforts to uh, combat um, narcotics and um, drug production and uh, conflict in the three countries. So this is kind of leading us to the next question. Uh, how are those different policy approaches to drugs and peace? How have they affect gender dynamics within the households? So in terms of the uh, policies and uh, approaches and how they are um, changing the gender dynamics, uh, as we mentioned in the case of Afghanistan, um, opium production, for example, or drugs are uh, part of the rural household livelihoods. Uh, and the livelihoods means basically that's the source that feeds the family. And the family decision making here in how that sort of the policies are, are have affected is in some cases, for example, now we are doing through the drugs and disorder project, we are looking at the um, one of the alternative uh, development programs. And we see that in instances they have gone to the communities and well, I mean, I don't want to go into details of that, but they first gone to communities that are not producing drugs and just covered the province unit, but not the districts where the drugs are being cultivated. But in areas, in some areas where there has been some cultivation, they, the fact that they have provided opportunities like income generating opportunities, encouraging women to take part uh, and allowing women to have some income from those, for example, chicken farms or gardens or, you know, gardenings or other agriculture activities, they have um, uh, influence to a level um, uh, the, 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 the role that women can have in, in terms of decision making at the household level. Uh, and this is one aspect that I think is important in broader sort of community development uh, discussions, but also in ones that are focusing on alternative livelihoods. Uh, that level of confidence women get in terms of, um, you know, uh, focusing on um, 
uh, 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 basically um, uh, women only in terms of their you know provision of uh, services to them is bringing a change in terms of the decision makings of family but all very much depends in terms of longer term in future looking it depends on the absence of these programs and what will be a simple dry sort of top decision of banning it and how people will respond will also be uh, very important to be seen in terms of uh, future thank you Rosalind. Yeah, so as I told you, th there were some designs uh, in the peace agreement like to try to include women, but still um, these designs seem not to take into account like the level of involvement that women have in illicit economies. So women farmers in Colombia are actively involved in coca production. This allowed them to have some relative economic empowerment. Many of them own their own crops and work as harvesters. So through these activities, they generate individual income that can that they can control. They actually can make decisions about what to do with this money. And if there is one thing that we know about economic empowerment, the literature on agrarian economies shows us that is that um, that the, the the fact that women can control their own assets is uh, like it's um, there is a relationship between this control of their own assets assets and the reduction of domestic violence and the reduction of the subordination of women uh, to the men whom they have their relationships, fathers, brothers, or partners. Uh, so when a woman has the ability to control her time and decide about her, about her, her money and her wealth is necessarily more a more dependent women. However, the interventions framed within the peace process did not take into account the situation of women. The substitution program was designed for families. That is, uh, the economic and productive incentives are given to a family unit and not to the individuals that compose this family. So the mass majority of incentives were received by men who present them themselves as the heads of households. So women did not have the option of enrolling uh, like individually in the program or on their own, but they were forced to abandon their, their cultivation. So this implies a reversal of the economic empowerment they achieved before the program. Also, like the, all these forced interventions have led uh, uh, to like an increase in the violence between the civil society and the public force. We have seen that in the past two or three years, uh, some men have died in the midst of the protests, uh, like to, when, when they are protesting these these forced eradication programs, so also this is like something that is breaking the social tissue. I mean, men who are fathers, who are husbands, are just uh, dying because of the confrontations of the public force. So this is something that we also must take into account, like how the interventions uh, of, from the government actually affect the family's composition. Thank you so much. This is extremely interesting and extremely relevant as well for the conversation. Uh, Mandy, do you want to bring us insight from Myanmar? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a really challenging question to address because, like I said previously, there hasn't been any um, connecting of the dots of, of gender and drugs policy at all. So, you know, if you want to work out what's how how one has affected the other you really have to look through multiple layers and kind of peel back different um, ways that policies are kind of rolled out in in sometimes not very obvious ways on the ground um, but thinking about the immediate impact of the way that drugs are handled within communities I mean the, there's the, the shift to new forms of, of drugs, particularly um, heroin and metham methamphetamine and new forms of ingestion as well. So um, people uh, injecting rather than smoking um, in particular, um, that seems to have created different kinds of discourses around um, stigmatization. And um, given that the, the general perception is that drugs are predominantly a male problem, even though that's not true. And you've got increasing numbers of women who, um, in the past also, um, women would use opium, but increasing numbers are, of women who are coming forward for support with uh, with their drug use and um, various issues related to that. So that, you know, we're aware that this is not just a male issue at all, but the majority of, of users tend to be male. Um, and so this, the kind of stigmatization that then become associated with them um, and their kind of 
a sense of failing to be able to fulfill that kind of masculinized economic and social and political role. I think that, you know, that's an area of research that needs to be undertaken um, because that, that seems to have had a, a really big impact upon, um, you know, kind of psychosocial well-being and all of these issues. Um, and then also the way that women respond to that and the feeling of neglect of the household or that they've been overburdened with resp economic responsibilities. Um, and th this sense of men being disconnected from their economic responsibilities through their drug use um, is also packaged up with the, um, with the legal responses to um, criminalising drugs too, where very, very harsh sentences are introduced for people who use drugs and maybe have just small, small amounts of, um, of drugs on them when they're arrested. So they can be sent to prison for, for very extended periods of time, which again, the, the rhetoric that persists around this is that, you know, this is a way of detaching men from their male responsibilities and then the burden is, is, is placed upon women and the demographics change and, and you know, the whole economic um, balance of the of the communities change that's the way it's presented and it's actually from that that kind of perception of how drugs policy um in the, the criminalization of drugs in particular in that particular dimension of it has had an impact on gender that that led to the um the emergence of the patch sun movement in response to that and and that perhaps connects also with the um the comment that monica made about who's leading the, the women's movements, who, what does activism or feminism mean in this context? Um, we, we wrote three articles about the Pachasan movement, uh, which people might want to, to follow up on, but you know, the women involved in that movement would not identify themselves as activists as such. They wouldn't identify themselves as feminists. Um, you know, they have a very, very different sense of how their, their, uh, their identity as women um, enables them to take up a certain kind of social and political space in relation to drugs and it doesn't necessarily open all the doors either. Thank you. This is really interesting for me to hear how like and I think this is quite an important point to keep in mind in general research and even more specifically when we are addressing gender issue, how you know very globalized understanding of the issues of drugs and conflicts and development have very, very different impacts in very different contexts and how they affect very differently the gender dynamics in three very di different regions. Um, so I'm just going to give back the floor to the three of you again and to let you explore from your perspectives what hearing about the different contexts bring to your mind and what are the new questions we are dealing with here or the new observations that we can put forward. Well, I think one is there, what we uh, talked a little bit about before is the um, rural approach, like understanding how this uh, drug economy is involved in a different way, whether we're talking about like the urban spaces or the rural spaces. And for example, one of them, of, of the like the goals that the national the team from the Universidad Nacional wanted to try is understanding a coca crop as an agrarian economy, just not like an, an illicit economy, like in abstract terms. So I think that's interesting and definitely thinking about how to um, manage to get these topics on the agenda. No, so like not assuming that in the countries there are no. Uh, like some intents from the women's movement to try to change things. I'm sure in every country there are organized women as mothers, as, I don't know, community leaders or whatever thing that we can understand in, within the specific context, like try to pay more attention to what they are doing. So just we can learn how to uh, read the context and how they are reading the context and how they are reading the possibilities they have to make actual change uh, in, in the policy agenda and in the political agenda, like trying to capture ally, allies to make some coalitions with some of the local leaders, I don't know. But I think that we still have a lot to learn about what is going on on the ground uh, at the local level. Thank you, Monica. I may come here with uh, sort of, uh, you know, listening to, to all of you and also thinking about, you know, again, Afghanistan as this context uh, in which we are. 
Um, what is going to happen as going way forward is also a change in the traditional sort of donors and respondents uh, sort of uh, uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, uh, as we move ahead, uh, I'm sort of observing the media and the response and reactions of different countries. Uh, we see that China is keeping a close eye on Afghanistan. So it's going to be one of the new actors in the region and trying to play a role in Afghanistan. And some reactions from the Chinese uh, sort of diplomats um, uh, and leaders towards Afghanistan when it comes to specifically talk about drugs is interesting because they are already quoting the Taliban spokesperson who said Afghanistan will be no longer um, a, a drug producing country. It, this is in a context where over 85 or 90% of drugs are produced as we were saying before. So we know the typical approach of Chinese uh, looking at the African examples or many other examples of how they are sort of engaging with countries with destitute level of poverty and all of that. So what potential sort of uh, ways of looking at it is that in case China follows the very sort of economic oriented approach by providing, you know, responding to the livelihoods issues, basically providing rurals with jobs or alternative jobs that can give them food instead, instead of, you know, going for poppy cultivation or meth production or all of that. The question that remains unanswered that needs to be sort of looked at is how to ensure the other aspects of you know, uh, opium uh, poppy uh, sort of production, or for example, these new elements that are getting these meta, meta sort of spread in the country and so forth. And particularly when it comes to the human rights dimension of issues or, or gender dimension of issues, because it requires a further study at least um, historically in terms of, you know, the Chinese approach towards uh, poppy cultivation. We know that China had an opium war in the history. We know that they have also had their own approaches. So at least in Afghanistan, we would require some more insights to understand, you know, this new economic, major economic player in the region and how would be their responses and how we can sort of adapt to make sure that it's also not remain reducing to purely economic response, but also ensuring that, you know, other social economic or socio-cultural aspect of matters are uh, uh, taken into consideration. One quick uh, sort of picture that reminds me, uh, uh, that we are reminded by is this uh, video of Taliban showing the harm reduction centers uh, where they shave completely the, the people who are sort of drug dependents and they are uh, using the water pipe, uh, you know, uh, uh, using them uh, for treatment. So these are well, raising the questions on human rights aspects. So these are examples of things that we have to be careful as we move ahead in terms of, you know, issues and also in terms of ways to look forward. Thank you, Arzalem. Mandy, do you want to add a word on the on the general uh, dimensions of uh, gender dynamics um, in households? Yeah, very, very briefly, I think one of the impressions I have from listening to Monica and Azala speaking and, you know, how we try to compare ideas around this is that, you know, it, it, it remains very challenging. Um, because of, and that also raises questions about how you um, compare experiences and talk about gender across the three different countries as well, because we tend to see women and see um, gender dynamics in the points where they kind of are they become visible because we have a particular perspective that we're taking or we're, we, uh, we are enabled by circumstance or position or context to, to have a, a certain line of connection. And then that shapes how we see these issues. But it's, it becomes really difficult when you start stepping back and thinking, OK, well, what, what are the, the kind of common threads um, that we can discuss in particular women's roles um, in relation to drugs? And, and to do that in a way that doesn't just automatically assume and privilege Western feminism as the kind of primary uh, framework of analysis. That, 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 I think, is a really big challenge that we're still all grappling with, to be honest with you. Um, and, you know, it's something that can only come through ongoing communication and discussion and thinking about how methodologies produce particular kinds of outcomes as well. Um, so I, th I think it's a kind of methodological issue as well as a, a, an interpretive and analytical one. 
This is such an important point. Thank you for bringing that on board, Mandy. Um, so thank you so much for the three of you to joining the conversation today and for sharing your long experience and long exp uh, expertise. Uh, as well, trying to wrap up, um, is there any final work you want to mention or is there any specific points you want to raise in terms of what does it mean for you, for your research team, to think about gender when we think about transitions uh, from uh, work to peace? I do think that there should be uh, maybe more dialogue within the con or between the countries that are involved in all these uh, politics around drugs, because of course the context specifics are very important, but we never have to underestimate like how the agenda at the international level is being pushed and is being created and designed and implemented. So um, despite the differences in the context, we still have like some common issues regarding the drug and words and all these discourses around uh, drug trafficking and drug production. So yeah, definitely, I think that we need more dialogue to understand how we are relating to this global agenda on drugs uh, and how this agenda is actually affecting the specific context where we're working in. Thank you, Monica. Marzala, do you want to, put a, to, to share your final thoughts? I think I will also uh, uh, build on what Monica was saying in terms of, you know, the importance of uh, local and particularly borderland uh, voices in the global platforms. Uh, there is still a lot of uh, people talking among themselves at the global platforms when they talk about, you know, drugs uh, issues. Uh, within this project, we try to, you know, through voices of the borderlands, we try to make uh, some changes and bring in some of the voices from the borderlands. But I think that requires to, to be strengthened further. I think there is a def definite need in bringing the voices from very local unions, local organizations that are operating in those areas to become the voices of the uh, uh, people at the, at the global level, because no one can better explain the situation, the context than those who are actually directly uh, affected by and that uh, is one aspect the other suggestion I would like to make is is uh, looking like I said in my earlier comments looking into non-traditional actors and bringing them also finding UN pl platforms or other platforms to engage with Chinese for example if they become a significant economic player on these in this context they need to be part of the conversation and not left aside or outside of it I just wanted to add one, one point, um, because I think with what Monica and Ozala has said is really important. Um, first of all, Monica saying about pushing, where, where is the agenda around drugs being pushed from? You know, what level does it operate and how do we all interact with that and how does that affect how we see gender? Um, but then also with Ozala saying we need authentic voices um, from the borderlands to, to come forward and, you know, be, be heard more clearly and respected. But I, I just really want to emphasise that we have to also be prepared when we do that, that we might not always like what we hear. And there might be an incredible tension and an ideological division between, you know, this kind of bubble of policymakers and, and you know, the drugs world that operates in international organisations and how local people feel and experience and think about these issues on the ground. And, you know, too often they're dismissed because they make us feel uncomfortable or we just feel that, you know, they're, they're, they come from the illiterate or the ignorant or the prejudiced. And, you know, we, we have to find different ways of understanding how to interact with those, those voices and experiences in a way that takes them seriously when they just make us feel very, very uncomfortable sometimes as well. Thank you so much. This is, uh, like, I think those are a very strong point to uh, wrap up and conclude the conversation today. Uh, I'm sure there is so much more to be researched and be raised on the, those entanglements between drugs development uh, and uh, peace policies. And thank you so much to the three of you to create the time of your very busy schedule to have this conversation with me here today. Thank you. Thank you.